Hello, welcome to the show. Today, I am joined by Amanda Georgioff, who is an area vice president of enterprise sales with Sales Loft. Amanda, thank you for joining the show. Josh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, I think Sales Loft is one of those brands that's fairly recognizable in the sales tech and, and martech landscape. But, um, you know, we talk about enterprise sales a bit on this show. And when we were talking a little bit pre show, it sounds like enterprise wasn't just a natural thing for Sales Loft. <laughs> For any company, there's nothing yeah. natural or organic about enterprise selling, right? It's yeah. um, no, I mean, I, I joined Sales Loft uh, a little over four years ago, and um, I was I was five months pregnant at the time, oh, wow. and with my daughter, and I was one of one of uh, a handful of our first enterprise sellers. Um, and what I've really learned in the last four years, I mean, we grew up like so many. Uh, SaaS companies. We grew up in the commercial or SMB yeah. space, and we'd been we continue to be wildly successful there. But you know, maybe five years ago, uh, we dipped our toe in the water selling up market. And and what I've really learned in my last four years here, as I've watched us grow exponentially in the enterprise right. space, is just um, how 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 complex it is to build an enterprise sales organization. Right? It is so much more than just opening up the book of accounts and throwing some tenured reps on yeah. them and saying go, right? So that's a little bit of what you and I were chatting about beforehand is just what does it mean? What are the mechanics of building an enterprise sales organization? Well, let's get into that because it's funny you say that, go up market. Because I feel like all these SaaS companies, they get these big rounds of investment, right? Yeah. And, and Sales Loft is no different. You've had plenty yeah. of rounds of investment over the years. Yeah. And all of a sudden, someone in leadership says, all right, it's time for us to go up market. We need to go sell into the enterprise. Yeah. And then, okay, great. What does that mean exactly? So I think that's a super interesting topic. And just to talk about what selling in the enterprise means and what that means to the business. And you made the comment, that doesn't mean just going and hiring a bunch of experienced enterprise salespeople. So let's dive into that a little bit. What are some of the things that you found that it actually means to go up market and sell into the enterprise? There's a few things that I've watched us do successfully over the last you know four years that I've been here as we've become you know such an established player in right. the enterprise space, right? And um, and it did by the way it did start with just hiring some tenured okay. reps. So that's and, a piece of the puzzle. Them, All right, that's fair. Yeah, that was the first step, right? Yeah. But what I what I've realized across the last four years is just how much more has gone into it because if I think about it, there the profile of seller that you're looking for right. is pretty specific and in some ways kind of a unicorn, right? Like you're looking for someone who has experience and has sold in the enterprise before, but someone also who is very much a builder and can okay. operate in shades of gray. Like when I started at our organization, we didn't have in-house corporate counsel. We have a much bigger legal team now, but one of the things, <laughs> but like we didn't have, we had, you know, outside count, you know, we just had uh, contract attorneys right. that were doing, you know, contract reviews for us. And so we've since obviously brought that in house. We have an sure. incredible legal team now, but that's just one example of something that in different areas of the business that are impacted because, which is why it's important to hire a profile of enterprise seller who is comfortable flexing and being creative and working you know, kind of working with an organization that is still being formulated, right? So like the, the rep profile that you hire is going to be really important because you need someone who rec like, you know, you, you can't bring enterprise sellers into the org into an organization like ours four years ago right. who need a lot of structure and need right. a lot of cross-functional partners because we didn't have that back then. But that's what we've built out over these last four years. You know, we had to think differently about the type of rep that we hired. We had to think about how to funnel feedback about the product, right? So your product has to evolve in a very specific way to meet the demands of enterprise companies. Um, the way we do, the way we think about our brand and marketing right. and events, that's all really different in the enterprise. Um, the way you and I met was through the build out right. of our channel and partners function, right? I mean, we have, we have a long history because we have an open API and I gosh, close to a hundred tech partners, sure. right? The integration partners. But one of the things we've been doing in the last year or so is building out a really strong bench of solutions partners, sure. right? So co-selling, partner selling, collaborating with partners, like that's a really new muscle for our organization. You know, I mentioned, you know, finance, deal structure, right. deal desk, right? Like in, in our commercial, in our commercial organization, there's was 
you know, not not very many different permutations of a contract, right? Sure. And I, and a market in the enterprise, it feels like every contract we do is bespoke and custom for those organizations. So there's just every bit of the organization is uh, is impacted by that move in the enterprise, and that's one of the things I've I've certainly learned from our CRO, um, Steve Goldberg, is just the, the the strongest enterprise sales organization is one that is surrounded by an internal group of resources, right? The best post-sales support. You know, we acquired our largest consulting partner in stereo a year ago and brought all of them in-house to bring all of that implementation and post-sale work. So there's just, it's by by agreeing to say, we're going to go up market, we're going to go into the enterprise. It just has such huge um, and lasting impacts on every part of your organization. It's really hard and really fun. Dude, I'm loving this. All right, so this is super yeah. tangible. We've got we've got rep profiling, which yeah. you know, like you said, just go hire some reps. But I like the profiling concept, so we're going to dig into that in just a second. Okay. The idea of post sales support, I think, is super important because the yep. expectations are so much higher, so right, much higher. at the enterprise level for what your software is going to do and yep. how they're going to be supported. Yep. Um, I have a story. Also, by the way, it ties to really great discovery and coaching through the sales process to make sure that you clearly understand those expectations and yet you're setting your customer up for success post sale. Got it. I love that. So we got profiling, we've got onboarding and support. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of partnership and enablement. Those could kind of be looked at as similar things, but as somewhat different as well. And then even the idea of legal being different, that is yeah. <laughs> fascinating to me, right? Like, you know, as a, we're, you know, we've been a small company forever and we were recently acquired. So we're a little bit bigger, but yeah, I mean, you're kind of cowboying it on the legal side. Like, uh, yeah, as long as the main things are good. <laughs> sure. If that, that sounds great to me. Awesome. We, I mean, we are, I mean, the last few years, again, since we've started working with really large companies, the, it changes how we forecast, right? right. Because Correct. the legal, I mean, it's the third sales cycle in our deals yes. is getting through and we, you know, getting through legal. And, and you know, as we're working with incredibly large, complex, risk averse organizations and they're yeah. buying sales loft for the, you know, and sales engagement category yeah. for the first time, like there's just a real impact to the legal process. And there's a lot of, it is, it's different at every company. It, it truly yeah. is, but there are enough commonalities and there's enough pieces of the legal process that you know are going to be sticking points them and you have enough repetition with them and you kind of learn ways to work through them and you learn how to coach your buyer to help you get through those. I will never forget the first deal I did with Pfizer. And we go through the business user, business user, we get aligned on all the terms, what the project is going to be and all this. And then they hand me over to this procurement person. And I said, all right, great. Well, I'll send you a copy of our master service agreement and we can start to go back and forth on that. And the, the guy paused for maybe oh, honey. Seconds, <laughs> and he just started laughing at me. Yeah. And you know, I, this was one of my first like big enterprise deals, probably five, five mm-hmm. years ago or so. And I'm, I'm like, what's, what's so funny? He goes, I'm not looking at your paper. That's right. And That's exactly I'm, like, right, Josh. <laughs> I, I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, what do we do? He's like, I'll send you mine. It mm-hmm. better not have a lot of red lines because we're not going to accept mm-hmm. many of them. So mm-hmm. go ahead and take a look and we'll see. And you can come back to me. And he goes, just so you know. Standard. Super standard. He goes, and just so you know, even if you make no red lines, this is still going to take six months. Yeah. And I'm like, what? That's right. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you talking about? And it wasn't even that big of a deal. And, and here's the thing. It is when you when you are building out an enterprise sales organization yeah. that right, you can know that as a rep but you also have to coach the rest of your organization on that like right. it's my responsibility it's our leadership team responsibility first to understand what that paper process is and to understand up front how to set expectations for how long right. that process is going to be enabling your buyer to help sort of shepherd you through that process but also setting expectations with our legal team and our finance team around like what do we expect this really big company to come back with? And, and what right. timeline is reasonable? Because while six months might, six months might just be it, we may just be doing this for six months. Um, or what's the what's the most expedited version of this look like? It still might be six weeks, right? right? And again, that's how I, and which is so different than, you know, smaller companies where things are more transactional, right? Like it is, um, it's just really important to understand that process, document it, and then take it back to the rest of your organization so that you can coach your colleagues around these are like, 
again, these are the hills we're going to need to die on. Like these right. are the, these are the sticking, like we're not going to be able to negotiate every piece of this. We need to, we need to figure out the ones Correct. that are most critical um, so that we can start working towards some sort of mutual agreement here. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting you say just like finding those hills to die on. So when we were a smaller company, our hill to die on was cash flow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like we prioritize cash flow over everything. Yeah. So if we could get people to agree to our payment terms, mm-hmm. we would almost acquiesce on everything else. Yeah. You know, we yeah. wouldn't obviously say that, but yeah. it was just like we would really think about the the, the maneuvering and based around cash flow. It's not as big a deal now as we've grown, and you know, yeah. we're working with lots of enterprise companies and this and that. But th- those were tough battles because. They don't want to pay net 30 up front. No, they're just yeah. like, go screw right. yourself. <laughs> or it's going to be net 90 in arrears. You know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. 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 Uh, no, no, no. I, I Yeah. I mean, that, and again, that's why going up market and entering the enterprise is such a collaborative organization wide initiative, right. right? Because again, it has implications for product. It has implications for your post sales organization, for CS and implementations. It has implications for finance. It has implications for your legal team, for your sales organization, for HR and recruiting. Like there's no part of our organization that hasn't been transformed by our growth in the enterprise. Um, And and it's been just really exciting. It's really special to have been here in like such the early days and have been part of this, this build out. Very cool. Well, can we talk about the profiling a little bit? Because yeah. one of the concepts I love on this show, you know, we always talk about in the market, product market fit. And I always like to talk about the concept of seller fit. So I can't remember how I describe it, but like as a seller, you need to have some self-awareness of what your strengths are mm-hmm. and where you want to go and where you're going to be successful, right? You need to find the right fit for you. So even that concept that you outlined of, if you are early stage going into the enterprise, like sales loft was four years ago, and you're looking for an enterprise seller, you need a little bit of a cowboy, right? Like someone who doesn't need a lot of process, can play you know, in the gray a little bit, is a little bit of a self-starter. Whereas if you go get someone who's been at, you know, selling at Oracle for a decade and everything is structured and built out, they're probably not gonna be successful in that, right? Like all of these different yeah. nuances of the sales motion. That's right. Someone who was in SMB before, maybe not, you know, all these different things. So how did you profile? Like, how did you think about identifying someone who could fit that profile for you at that time? Yeah. I mean, it's really, in my experience, it was really about being very transparent in the interview process, right? Like I, we needed people who could come in to our organization and, and, and had just a lot of grit. People who are, are comfortable being, responsible for our pipeline building on their own. Like right. we were in the early days, like we didn't have the presence and the brand awareness that we do now. And right. so we were doing a lot of educating and a lot of evangelizing. And I needed some, and I also needed someone who could come in and sort of see a need and fill a need, right? So someone who could come in and realize that like, we don't have a fully built out hundred person marketing organization, right. right? And you have, you have an SDR, but you're shared, your SDR is shared with multiple other AEs. Right. And, you know, we don't have a, a totally built out lead gen operation or um, partner sales, right? Like it's, we really needed folks who could come in and want, I talked all the time in interviews about examples of times where they've built out something from scratch at an organization, right? right? Like, because that's what we've been doing. The people who've been really successful here are are ones who've been able to come in and build alongside with us and be flexible, um, willing to roll up their sleeves, doers. Like I want people, I don't want someone who's going to come into our organization and just like think about a problem, right? Like (laughs) Goldberg, our CRO says all the time, like, we're not going to admire a problem. Like we're not going to just sit around, admire it, think about it, smile at it. Like we need doers. We need people who can come in and take action. And that's really what I was always pressure testing in an interview scenario of like, who can this person operate in an environment that is unformed in a lot of ways, someone who can come in and be successful in in a sales organization that to your point, doesn't have a lot of process yet. Now yeah, we do. Right. We're much, you know, again, we're much more mature. No, I get now. it. I get it. But yeah. in the early days, I did need someone who could come in and, you know, like we don't 
we don't have like a discovery call sign off process that's like super <laughs> built out and takes a month to do like week one. Why don't you just go ahead and get on the phone? Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. And again, like that profile has evolved over time, but you just need someone who was pretty flexible. Right. Um, and what hasn't changed, I think, um, in the last four years is, you know, I always prioritize hiring for a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Right. Uh, someone who is comfortable learning new things, who admits what they don't know, who, you know, is, uh, you know, willing to lean in and, and take criticism yeah. and admit failure. Like all of those really coachable aspects, those are, those are important in any stage of your growth. So I have like that, we have much more process now. We have a, um, you know, we have a lot, you know, we're, I mentioned we're rolling out MedPick. We have a much more formalized onboarding program. Like there's so many things about our enterprise mission that have grown up. Um, but that growth mindset element hasn't changed. That's still a really important characteristic because again, like we're, you know, now we're chasing the next milestone. Exactly right. Well, a couple of questions on that. So one is yeah. from a, how do you, did you find a place like that you could look for people like that? Cause that's always the hard part, right? Like so say you identify the characteristics, then where do you go to yeah. find them? Right? That's yeah, not a, I, just a, a well I of people. Think, no, you're right. You're right. Like I, I worked really closely with our, with our recruiting team. Right. And I, I was, you know, I had a list of companies that I knew did a really, that had really strong sales training programs. Okay. Right. Very cool. um, I'll tell you career builder. Career, people who were at Career Builder like 10 years ago, we've got a whole host of folks in our organization. Who wow, were part that's of fascinating. Program. They they had an excellent sales training program. Those people were really gritty. I came, I'm biased, but I came from CEB, okay. um, which is now part of Gartner. And and we had, our organization had a lot of that. People who were just gritty, hungry, hard workers, very oriented around the customer, very right. explicitly customer focused. And it just had a lot of hustle. And could do a lot of hard work. And again, Is that we're a services organization. CEB. Yeah. Uh, we sold research. Yeah. So, but it was subscription research. So okay. it wasn't SaaS, um, okay. but it was a subscription research model. Um, but ultimately, I mean, you're right. Like I, I, as I've, as I've kind of grown up in this role, I've started to pinpoint people who, um, you know, people who have some of these qualities. I, nobody wants someone who's jumped around a lot, right. but it was always interesting to see someone who had maybe come in and stayed at an organization for three or four years as the organization had grown. Yeah. Um, and can talk a little bit about their experience helping to build that organization. And again, operating without a lot of structure and being able to build the structure themselves. Very cool. A couple of places that I think are interesting around that profile. One is failed entrepreneurs. Mm. Just yeah. because, you know, they're building from scratch, even if their business failed, like yep. they still got that in them. And yeah. taking on an enterprise sales role is almost like a, a, a lower risk business venture. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I, I think yeah. that's one, one interesting place. And then the other is you mentioned the CEB. Like, mm -hmm. I think there's a very big difference in the way you sell when you don't mm -hmm. sell something tangible like software. Yeah. That's right. You don't have something, you don't have anything to show. That's right. Right. There's no one of one of the reasons why I think I <clears throat> I had a really not an easy transition into software, but why one of the one of the elements that I took from my time at CEB that translated really well into selling software was I mean CEB was research and even though right. it was subscription research, you know there's no feature function conversation. Exactly there's no right. demo. Like I never demoed CEB. Right. <laughs> What's your business? Process. You have to talk about their business. Yeah, and yeah. that's that has translated as you know easily into software. The best software salespeople are not getting into the weeds on, on features totally. and functionality, Love right? It. Like they are orienting the entire evaluation around the customer and their needs and the problems they need to solve and aligning, mapping their solution to those problems. And so, I mean, you're right, like that selling services um, mm -hmm. at CEB, uh, that, that was an element of my sales process there that I incorporated into my software sales career and has been a big part of my my success here. Yeah, I think it's a highly underutilized resource for for enterprise SaaS people to start looking for their next people because people who sell services have to be way more consultative just by nature. That's and right. I, I think it's a interesting thing to pe for sales leaders to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so shifting gears a little bit into the, you mentioned one of the components for moving up into the enterprise was the build out of the partner ecosystem. Yes. <laughs> Something near and dear to my heart. I've sold to and through software partners for the last 10 years of my career. So 
What have you learned? How's that been? Is it working? Is it not working? What are the pitfalls? Like, let's just dive into that a little bit. It's been so it's it's a new muscle for our organization, right? Like yeah. we didn't historically have a big channel or partner sales organization, but um, it's been it, it's been really valuable so far. And we are like we're still building that out, but it's just been a great way to, you know, ultimately get to know people that are in the same conversations with the same buyers, right? Yeah. Anything anything my sellers or I can do to come to a conversation with a, an executive or a potential buyer better educated about their business, about their needs, about their problems and things they're looking to solve is a win. You know, it creates so much credibility for my sellers. If they can come to an organization with information right. about that company that's informed by what we learned from a partner, and if we can provide that to a partner, that's great too. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, so I think it just always, always kind of the North Star is delivering that great experience to a, to a, a prospective buyer. And the way that partners help us achieve that, again, most of the partner organizations we're working with are in the same conversations with right. the same companies, with the same buyers. And, you know, we don't want our buyers to feel exhausted by another conversation with another potential right. partner. So again, you and I, if you and I can work together, sync up, we're targeting some of the similar, you know, some of the same companies, same buyers in those companies. And if we're able to share information with one another and better inform our uh, each of our individual hypotheses right. about how we'll be able to, you know, to better serve this customer, that's really, that I think that's been, that's what's been so valuable, right? And it, again, it just all goes back to making a better experience for our buyer, like making the buyer ultimately believe I want to work with sales loft. I want to yeah. work with shift, right? Like whoever, like I, that's how we, we want our buyers to, to feel, to, to want to take our call and to, to trust that if they talk to us, it's going to be a valuable, productive conversation. They're not repeating themselves. And so that's, you know, working with partners has helped us deliver that experience. Great. So those are all the good things, right? And obviously it's a new method. <laughs> What are the bumps? Like, what are the things you run into? Like, hey, someone who's thinking about building out a service partner organization, where are the friction? What are the things you run into that you just never even thought of? I mean, there's change management around it like there is with anything. And so yeah. with my AE team, it's making sure that my AEs, first of all, aren't going to partners and just asking for introductions. Oh, introduce me to this person, introduce sure. me to that person. That AEs recognize that this is a two-way street right? That this is a two-way street and that we need to give to get just like anything else. And so it's about making sure one, that AEs aren't just going out to partners, spamming them and asking for leads sure. and introductions. And likewise, making sure that we're not, that, you know, that we're, that we're collaborating with these yeah. partners when we do work together and that we're not shying away from that conversation, that we're not feeling, it just goes back to that growth mindset. If you have a <laughs> scarcity mindset, Right? right, a scarcity mindset sounds like I don't want to engage a partner because what if that business decides that they need the partner more than they need me? Right. There's a right. you know there's a fixed part there's a fixed That's pot a of money. One. That's a, there's a fixed pot of budget yeah. dollars, right? And I don't want to risk giving up some of my budget dollars to the partner. But that's right. the wrong mindset, right? Because again, if the North Star is what's best for the customer, maybe maybe it is better to do consulting services first but if that sets us up for a right. better software sales engagement later with that customer and ultimately enables that customer to get more out of an investment with us like again the what is best for the customer has to be the north has star and right. you can't have that fixed mindset of i don't want to bring a partner into this because it could tank my deal and yeah. again steve goldberg will tell you that the the, the most impactful, meaningful, biggest deals he ever did were with partners. That's great. And timing is everything when it comes to selling alongside a partner and making, but it, it just goes back to coaching your reps through that perhaps immediate fixed mindset <laughs> of, I don't want to bring somebody else in on this deal. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's just, I mean, that's just, you know, a newer muscle for some folks. That leadership's really important though. Like someone who's been there and can mm -hmm. point to the fact that they've done X, Y, Z deal. And yeah. here are the reasons why I did it. And some of those reasons, I'm not saying all of those reasons, but yeah. there were very tangible reasons that the partner was a part of that, right? Okay. So if you can continually reinforce those things with the team, like you said, um, you know, maybe it comes down to you from Steve and you're able to like really evangelize it. Like, that's amazing. I, I, yeah. I think that's so important. It doesn't happen enough. Yeah. Tru truly. Did you ever run into any, um, and this is something I've run into before, I think maybe doesn't get thought about, or maybe as an afterthought, con uh, compensation conflict 
um, with the reps? With partners? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is it is tricky. It is nuanced, right? I mean, you have to make sure that when you're, and I, you know, I, I wasn't personally responsible for building out our, our partners team here, yeah. but I know that's something we think a lot about. It's something that Steve thinks a lot about is, again, eliminating friction, making yeah. it easy for reps to bring partners in on deals, thinking about ways that we can retire quota differently or, yeah. and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not forever, right? Sure. But just to get just to get things off the ground, to get those conversations started. Um, so yes, there are absolutely incentive and compensation elements to that quota retirement, commissions, et cetera. But, but it does also, you know, comp isn't the only lever there. And you, sure. you, as a leader, to your point, it's my responsibility. It's Steve, Amy, Michelle, our whole leadership team. It's our responsibility to coach our AEs on how to think about our relationship with partners and how to think about the potential benefits um, and and the, the wins for our customer. Um, and again, I always go back to this idea: like if you're just doing what's best for the customer, right? And you're like, and that is that is the north star. That is the focus. Everything else tends to fall into place. Yeah, one of the things that when we so Amanda and I met for lunch a few weeks ago in Austin yeah. at, a, at a partner event, and yeah. one of the things that I took away from that conversation as it came to partnerships was the fact that the structure of how your team is compensated really fits in well with the partner ecosystem. And you have yeah. a, a very much a land and expand we do. mindset within the group. So as a partner, the way I think about that is, okay, great. If we can land together, then yep. where the partnership can really show value is by making that land very tangible. And what I mean yeah. by that is setting clear benchmarks for success. That's right. That as the partner, we need to be responsible for driving. Yep implementation, change management, adoption, rollout, like all of those things, you're trusting us yeah. to make sure that we can deliver, track and measure on those things and then build that business case with you then to say, all right, now we need to tap into your benchmark data and say, what does the expand look like, right? And yeah. that to me, when we got when we went to lunch together, I think that's what got me excited is that opportunity is there. And I don't think enough companies think about that. It's so important because, I, you know, most software is land and expand, yeah, <laughs> right? right? Particularly in the enterprise, particularly sure. when you're building a new category like right. sales engagement, right? It is, un you know, and sales engagement is an adoption-driven ROI product. If your sellers aren't using it, it is damn near impossible to show right. ROI, right? And so, and so that's why, you know, with a land and expand motion, we need to make sure that post-sale, our customers are successful and they're seeing the benefits and they're seeing, um, they're get, they're, they were meeting those expectations. Um, and that's where I, you know, you and I chatted a little bit about how our two organizations could work together to, yeah. to help drive that benefit for the customer, to make sure that, that we're setting out those, those benchmarks from the outset and then delivering on them post-sale so that we, totally. so that it is so successful that we've earned the right, uh, and not even the right to ask, but the customer will come to us and right. say, this thing is catching on like wildfire. I really want to add other parts of my organization, but that, that, that doesn't happen unless we're making our customers successful. Love it. Yeah. I'm always fascinated at how organizations build out their, you know, ROI models or business cases. Mm -hmm. Um, typically depending on what you do, you, you identify a few key levers that, yep. you know, make sense to the C-suite. What are some yep. of those things that your best players have have uncovered that are like, man, if I can impact these couple things, it gets them excited. Yeah. yeah. So for sales loft, um, in our sales engagement category specifically, you know, ultimately the different facets of our platform will make your sellers more productive, whether you're using our, our, our cadences, whether you're using our, you know, conversation intelligence, which is native to the platform, our deals, which is our pipeline management, our forecasting module, all of these things that comprise the sales loft platform are designed to make your sellers more productive and make it easier for them to execute their day, right? If you think about the world of a seller where they've yeah. got 15 tabs open, they've got their email inbox, they've got their CRM, they have five different spreadsheets, yeah. reports, BI tools, they're clicking around, like it's it's chaos. It's yeah. barely organized chaos. And so our goal is to, is to unwind all of that chaos and give sellers an, an easier environment in which to work. And if I think about that, the ROI that comes from that and the metrics that we look at are, are you able to create more opportunities, right? Like what we can't do at SalesLoft is sign up for revenue right. attribution, right? Totally. Because here's the thing, like there's a, once you create that opportunity, 
right? Like once you create pipeline, right? right? And create that opportunity, there's still a lot of things that happen between that and a closed one deal. And the sales engagement platform can't necessarily impact all of sure. those, right? Like a, there's a lot that, you know, whether it's product market fit or how the rep runs the call, like there's a lot there. But I think what we tend to focus on is those leading indicators of yeah. success. And some of those leading indicators are, you know, more, you know, more meetings booked, more um, opportunities created, um, deal velocity, right? Like how quickly a deal closes. Yep. Like there's a few metrics like that. Um and then on the call coaching side, like, you know, the amount of time that managers can spend right. coaching versus not. I mean, there's just there's a few metrics there that we're starting to really dig in on. But again, like we're looking at if there's if we're improving those top those top of sales funnel leading indicators and all else remains equal, but we improve the top of the funnel, the downstream impact should be there. And that's awesome. what we're tracking post sale. So you just um very innocently touched on something when you, you mentioned call recording because that yeah. was an acquisition, right? And you see that happening. Okay, one of those decisions we need to go up market. Oh, great! Our our, our solution is not built for up market. How do we make it up market? We start acquiring things and plugging them That's in, right. and this and that. Mm-hmm. So, as it relates to the land and expand, mm-hmm. you know, go to market motion. What does expansion look like? Is it look like a base product and add in some of those additional things? Is it we start with a pilot team and then add it into other teams? Is it a combination of those? Like, how yeah, do you think both. about that? It's both for sure. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, I we all know that in order to you know in order to have a successful expansion motion, you need to probably have more than one product to yeah. sell your customers, right? And tech stack consolidation is real. Like the yeah. sales tech stack is super super big. Right, right now, and it's becoming really challenging for organizations, rev ops, IT, sales mm-hmm. leadership to manage the multiple parts of their sales tech stack. Right. So consolidation is really important to those organizations, and that's a problem that we solve. Um, so having a few, so expansion for us could look like selling different facets or components of our right. platform to existing customers. Or, I mean, yes, I mean for the really big companies that we're working with that have tens of thousands of sellers. Yeah. You know, sales engagement's a new category. They're not signing up for everybody all at once. Right. It typically does start with, you know, a a the, a group to go first, and whether that's a region or a business unit or something along those guys, it's important that it's statistically relevant, right? Like, I mean, it needs yeah. to be. You know, you need to have if you're going to start with one group, you want to make sure it's a group that uh, has the characteristics: early adopters, you know, maybe more tech savvy than others. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, then it then it usually rolls out to other roles within the repetition of the word roles. It yeah. uh, it expands to to other roles within the organization, right? Whether that's you know our customer a customer success organization, a field sales organization, um, all the different sort of customer facing roles that exist within an organization. Very cool. Well, with the last couple of minutes here, yeah. what are you seeing? Because you mentioned, you know, maybe a pilot would be with an inside sales team and then you might try to expand mm-hmm. into a field sales team. Yeah. Um, you know, when COVID hit, inside <laughs> sellers had the uh, the inside track on yeah. keeping their livelihood going and field sales, you know, fell off the face of the planet. People mm-hmm. who manage their life around, on Tuesday, I go to Ohio and on yeah. Thursday, I go to Michigan. I have my three meetings for the week. And then the rest of the week, I'm on the plane. Their life just got flipped upside down. Yeah. What are you seeing now in the market with um, inside sales, field sales? What's the future look like? I, What I will tell you is that everyone seems to be very eager to meet in person right now. Yes, like I, I think agree. everyone feels... And everyone I talk to who who has an in person meeting with a customer is thrilled to be there, it's including amazing. the customers. Yeah, and like everyone loves being back in person. I think it took yeah. two years of us being at home, right. right? Sort of trapped in a home office, trapped on Zoom. Like there's just in person meetings with customers are not going away. Like we're right. never gonna. I I don't. I firmly don't believe that we're going to be in an all inside all digital sales environment. We're just not yeah. because. I go and I have dinner with customers. I go to events with customers. I spend time on site with customers. What you learn about their business, about their personal goals, their wins, cannot be replicated on a Zoom meeting, period, full stop. Correct. Yep. Well, I, and I'm seeing a real eagerness on the customer side. They want to meet with people again, right? Like they're tired of doing four-hour whiteboarding sessions, mapping out an implementation on Zoom. Right. They want to be in person to do that. And so 
I'm seeing right now a big explosion of in-person meetings. I have so much in-person <laughs> stuff going on right now. That's good. Events are back, right? right. Um, in-person lunches, meetings. We're getting on planes all the time. Right. Um, but I also don't think that means that digital selling is dead either. It's not sure. either or. It's going to be a hybrid. It's, I, I believe it'll be a hybrid mixed environment going forward there, which is, and by the way, when you're out on the road, I'm sure sellers are feeling this now, like you realize how quickly you get behind on shit. Oh my Sorry. gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. You realize that, you want. Like you get, you just get really behind when yeah, you're in totally. a meeting. Your inbox blows up. And, and in fact, it's where sales engagement technology, a platform like SalesLoft is really important. You're on that plane, you're flying home, you're, you're using our, our technology to update your pipeline, to, you know, take notes and review a call, to, you know, track a couple of emails, run a few cadence steps, like that platform in in flight, literally on an airplane becomes really valuable um, because you're just not in front of your computer all day, the way we were for two years with COVID. I love the plug. Nicely done. <laughs> way, way, to, way to wrap it in there very organically and naturally. That's perfect. That's all right. right. So That's right. if there's one thing you want everyone to take away about selling in the enterprise, what would that be? Oh my gosh. Great question. Um, mindset is everything. Okay. That's what I would go back to. Mindset is everything. There's so much that's out of your control as a seller, right? We don't control the outcomes. We can only control the inputs. And enterprise sales is, um, it's a long process. It's an arduous process. You have to celebrate the small wins. Yeah. But most importantly, you have to have the right attitude and the right mindset. It is all about the customer. And it's all about getting in there every day, putting in the work, incrementality, and then all of that great every day, day after day work leads to the right outcomes. It really does. But it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And you have to have resilience and you have to have a great attitude. Because ultimately, like we're just trying to earn a next conversation with another person. Yeah. And I find if you ha- if you show up well for a conversation, you're well prepared, you're well researched, you're credible, you're focused on them, you're listening, you're doing all those things, they'll want to talk to you again. And along the way, like, along the way, you'll find a path toward working together. Very good. I love it. All right. So if you want to find out more from SalesLoft, go to salesloft.com. Pretty mm-hmm. easy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. That's right. That's Amanda, right. You're I, on hope LinkedIn. So. I hope we didn't change the website anytime soon. Nope, website's still the same. Amanda's on LinkedIn. Amanda Georgeoff. You can find her there if you want to get more insights on selling in the enterprise. I'm sure you're always hiring. The market needs people, right? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Right. Good. Amanda, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. 